Thank you. I, I, I'd like to uh, personally add my thanks to uh, Dave, Dave Roger. Did, he, did Dave leave by now? But I wanted to uh, just uh, thank you uh, again for, uh, for all that you and the Hillman Foundation has done. This, this really is phenomenal to see what, the, what that uh, vision has uh, come to. Uh, I, I'm very excited about uh, this particular panel. Uh, and the uh, set of uh, amazing panelists that we've got uh, to, uh, to speak with you. Uh, the, the topic of, it, of the panel is the science of smart cities. What is a science? Well, uh, it starts with an understanding of the components and systems and terminologies that uh, those within the science use to describe what's going on. It starts with a better understanding of the interaction dynamics of what's going on uh, between those components and, and, and how they form systems and how they behave. Uh, you start to understand what is healthy, normal, good versus what isn't. The science helps you to start to understand that. It's, it, you, you start to understand what is known and what isn't known. Uh, and you focus on uh, the unknowns and, and, and you accept the knowns uh, as, as, as facts. And then uh, we start to ask, what does our science predict? So uh, I uh, look forward to the comments of our panelists uh, and um, ask them, uh, to each uh, in briefly introduce themselves and talk for a few minutes about uh, their view on and what their work they're doing, uh, it, how it relates to this concept of the science uh, uh, of smart cities. And um, please start. I look forward to your comments. Let's uh, start with uh, uh, Alex Sholdashova, and, uh, and then we'll go down the, uh, the, the line and have each uh, of our panelists introduce themselves. Thanks, Jim. Um, so first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm an assistant professor here at the Heinz College. Um, my official title is Statistics and Public Policy. My background is in the first, and I'm working on the latter. Um, when I think of the science of smart cities, what comes most naturally to my mind and my disciplinary training is the data science of smart cities. And I'm really proud of the, some of the work that we've been doing, especially with our county collaborators, for instance, in the child welfare system, trying to use the data that's available to provide a more strategic delivery of services to some of the most disadvantaged members of our community. Uh, to give you a sense of why I'm so proud of this work, we, back in November, had a team from Denmark come here to learn from what we were doing. So I think when Denmark comes to you to learn about how you are using data to improve your child welfare system, um, that's a big win. Now there are lots of challenges here. Many of them are technical, many of them are policy. Uh, but again, this is extremely exciting work that's really picking up. And to iterate all these points, it starts here and then everyone else tends to follow. Great, uh, Kristen Curland yes. from the Heinz. So hi, I'm Kristen Curland, and I um, am a joint professor between the School of Architecture, the Heinz College, and I have a courtesy appointment in civil and environmental engineering. So that kind of gives you an idea of the cross-disciplinary nature of what I do. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, collaboration, because I think that collaboration is one of the key factors here. And we talked about that a little bit earlier this morning. Um, my world is collaborating not only between what we have here at, the, uh, at Carnegie Mellon, but also externally. My research is health and the built environment. And I do a lot of collaborative projects with uh, physicians at UPMC and Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. I just wanted to mention a, a quick example. I recently did a project uh, with physicians looking at why kids don't show up for well visits in a clinic here in Oakland. And we did a lot of the data analytics. I, I do um, sp geospatial um, analytics, and I used uh, tools to identify what neighborhoods those kids were coming from. But what was really important in this project was we identified that, and then we were trying to solve the issue as to why they weren't showing up. We had uh, preconceived notions about transportation and other issues that we, we thought that we knew what it was. Um, but what we ended up doing was convening a, um, a facilitator to actually go into the neighborhood, uh, work with the, uh, the actual patients that weren't showing up and the families. And we found out it was actually a trust issue. And it was a trust issue with um, not seeing the same physician every time that they were coming to the clinic. So I think that 
that we talked a little bit earlier about how do we engage citizens in our uh, research and our projects, and it's, that's probably one of the more difficult things to look at, especially when you're looking at, at uh, cases like this. So this is one of the things that I think that um, you know we do well at Carnegie Mellon, and we do a lot of this science well, but how do we then engage the citizens? And I want to mention one thing that I think we have another secret sauce um, to Carnegie Mellon, and that's interdisciplinary, but I would say it's our students as well. And so I want to give a shout out to the students that we have. There's probably far more projects than any of us know about that are happening here at Carnegie Mellon. I see it in my classrooms, and I see the engagement that the students have at different levels. So I think that that's um, something that um, we have to look forward to, to engaging our students. And then just very quickly, the other uh, work that I do is with architecture and planning. And Don Carter mentioned our project a little bit earlier today, but we're working on some really interesting cross-disciplinary projects looking at 3D visualization and, um, and using different kinds of tools to help um, inform citizens as well. Thank you, Kristen. My colleague, Jose Mora, from the College of Engineers. Thank you. Uh, so I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering in the College of Engineering. And, um, I, I'm, what I'd like to, to tell you about is, uh, first of all, the cities on a personal basis provide actually a great opportunity to work with people that uh, I actually uh, hadn't had the opportunity before. So uh, when we started, Manuel and I were on sabbatical at uh, NYU at CUSP, we interact a lot with physicists, and physicists that were looking at problems of cities. Uh, which was a surprise. Why were these people concerned with the, the high energy physics and particles uh, in uh, uh, accelerators and so forth? Why were they looking at cities? And uh, their, their take was looking at cities from a scale point of view, looking as, uh, uh, which, which is uh, an interesting point. Back to, to CMU, it turned out that it also provided, uh, uh, personally to me, to go to a college that I never worked with uh, before, I think, which is the, the, your college, the architecture, the College of, of Arts, I guess, and with Don Carter that is somewhere there. And it has been a pleasure because we talk technology and he doesn't really talk about arts, but talks about the cities and the, how the cities are organized and the, how whatever we do should impact impact the cities. And so uh, Don, uh, Sean uh, Kian from, uh, from Civil and the Heinz and uh, Shomokar from ECE, we have been for the last couple of years brainstorming of uh, how do we look at the city and looking at the city from an environmental point of view, looking at the city from the built infrastructure and uh, these pests that also are in the city, which are the humans. And uh, we took the point of view of looking at that uh, system of systems, as we heard this morning, looking at it from the point of view of mobility. So don't look at everything, focus on mobility. And even focusing on mobility, you get to see lots of different dimensions. So mobility not as a social mobility or economic mobility, but mobility as, tra as, a, as a transferring people uh, uh, from A to B. And actually, when you look at mobility and look at the city from that point of view, you start uh, seeing all the, rela uh, the interrelations between these different facts. And uh, the point of view we have taken is don't look at a particular point of the city or another point or a succession of points. Look at the city globally. Th look at the city as the whole extent in space and in time, and try to see at 9 o'clock in the morning when people go from uh, 279 all the way to downtown or maybe to Oakland, try to see all those people coming from all different directions, cr crisscrossing each other. Can you understand what, what's happening? Can you, as this morning was, uh, was suggested, can you predict something? Or, or if there is a storm tomorrow, can you take some remedial action and try to ease how people will flow. So that's the point of view that we have been taking, looking at the city, how people populate, uh, how people impact the environment of the city, how the, the built environment impacts, how people move around, try to understand that. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. 
Satya from Computer Science. Um, thank you, Jim. My name is Satya. I'm a professor of computer science, and um, I work on a new emerging area called edge computing, which was really pioneered by my research group and is now being embraced uh, widely. Um, all of you know what cloud computing is. Edge computing is taking the power of the cloud, but placing it very close to where data is being gathered in real time. Think of large numbers of video cameras widely deployed, perhaps multiple video cameras per automobile, capturing in real time data, processing it, extracting information, and fusing it. What can, you, what can this do for an area like a city? What it can do is effectively help you create a nervous system. Something that helps you sense, process, and hopefully intelligently react to phenomena as they are occurring. As Jose and others on this panel have remarked, there's a tremendous amount of science that people have already um, built up surrounding urban areas and, and similar, similar um, ge geographic settings. But most of that has been done in batch mode, where the data is gathered, processed, the results are obtained next week, and the paper published a few months hence. Transforming that into actionable information that synthesizes and fuses high data rate sensor inputs using algorithms that are today only possible in the cloud is really the focus of my work. So um, in partnership with a number of companies, Crown Castle, which I believe is represented here in the form of Chris Bloomley, uh, Verizon, Vodafone, Deutsche Telekom, and others, we are creating a living edge lab in Pittsburgh. And we already have wireless antennas on campus in Oakland and in um, Walnut Street in Shadyside. And that's an example of what Dave Rogers was mentioning. He took actual permission from the city to install those things. And thanks to Crown Castle for doing all the hard work on that. So this is why what I'm doing is relevant to smart cities. And I cannot think of a more exciting opportunity. Thank you for being here. Uh, and well, Veloso. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Manuel Veloso, and I'm uh, um, a professor in uh, the School of Computer Science, currently the head of the machine learning department. But I do have appointments in computer science, in electrical engineering, and in the Robotics Institute. So um, like uh, Jose was saying, we were on sabbatical at, uh, in New York at this uh, Center for Urban Science and Progress called CUSP uh, in its very beginning. And uh, I got a chance of spending one year talking in workshops with uh, multiple entities of the city, the police department, the mayor office, the transportation, parks and recreation, uh, sewage, uh, you name it. We met actually to, with groups of people uh, that were responsible for a variety of aspects of the city. We actually, we actually took it very seriously, uh, these workshops and these connections with who are supposed to be the scientists and the researchers, be it physicists or computer scientists, they share their problems. And so I kind of like, uh, well, I, when I was there, I did a lot of work with uh, 311 data and all sorts of like uh, also uh, trying to understand traffic. But what was more compelling to me uh, in some sense was the fact that I don't know, is, it was the fact that in some sense there were people involved in all these cities that would need a lot of support from data uh, to take, make decisions. I remember the mayor approached CUSP with the question, where should they build the new, the next 100 kindergarten schools? Was it going to be on the intersection of 122nd with the uh, second avenue or down in 53rd and and third and seventh avenue and how where would, should these be and what would be the impact of those decisions in the functioning of the city 
So I thought that, I mean, and that is along a lot of decision making along the lines of the research I do in trying to automate agents to make decisions by combining data, uh, some kind of planning to achieve goals, and eventually actually making the decisions. But the aspect that I think that I would like to emphasize with us all here is that whatever we do in a city, more than not processing data, uh, making analysis, uh, creating uh, infrastructure, needs to be well justified for the humans. So there is this aspect in machine learning in AI that it will not help a city, it will not help decision makers if our systems are black boxes that just say, yeah, put the next kindergarten there. And then the mayor or the humans involved in all these governance will ask why. And these machines will be black boxes that say, because I say, uh, or something like this. So that's the research I've done a lot. And I believe it will be part of this automation of cities and the automation of all this processing of information and data and the support is really to provide the interpretability and the explanations that these data analysis needs to provide and especially to uh, support decisions in cities which cannot function without the involvement of people governing them. And so that's one aspect that maybe uh, it's common to also a doctor's office, but I think for cities in particular that so many decisions are long lasting, so you cannot decide I'm going to put this building here and tomorrow, yeah, yeah, by the way, I'm going to move it to the next corner. So they, this is a type of, from a mathematical point of view of decisions that are different than a decision that a robot or an agent does in turning left because it can, Recover, it can recover afterwards. In cities, the, the, these meetings with the city of New York officers were very kind of striking for the long-lasting decisions. You decide to change the traffic like that, and it stays like that. You decide to put in a building like that, and it stays like that. So I really think that the explanation process and getting input from humans and biases and all sorts of like uh, uh, being in this uh, interpretability and explanation mode is essential for the automation of a city. Thank you, Manuela. Thank you for all, to all the panelists. Uh, to, to kick this off, my plan, by the way, is to ask uh, one or two questions uh, or have the panelists ask each other questions uh, and then open it up to the, uh, to the audience. Uh, the first question I have is, you know, we've talked a lot about cities being you know, systems of systems. And uh, will the science be a science of Sciences, in other words, is this is the science of cities a is it a political science? Is it a social science? Is it a physical science? Is it a information science? I mean, I, I think parts of all those sciences are going to have to impact um, this science of cities. And will we ever get to a, a an understanding of the knowns of a city that will allow us to be predictive, as Jose said? I think being predictive is an important uh, ability uh, of, of a science. Does anybody want to talk about that? Let me start by making one point, um, which is especially important to keep in mind when we're thinking about human services and criminal justice. And it's that data is not neutral and data is not objective. If you think about the sort of data that we collect on citizens at this point in time and what we have available historically, this has been shaped by decades of mm. processes, societal, political, and many of those processes have been discriminatory. So if you're thinking about even built infrastructure and you're ruling out certain locations because currently they do not look very good, it doesn't mean that that's an objective fact about those locations or those communities. And it's certainly not the case that just because you're finding crime where you bother to go search for it, that that's a practice you should perpetuate. So part of, I think, the science of, of smart cities is making better use of our data. And an important part of that is making sure that we understand the process that generated that data and the inferences that we can draw that hold some value and which ones are simply risking perpetuating the same mistakes we've made before. In other words, we want to be learning from our mistakes, not simply learning to replicate them. Hmm. I, I, I was just going to, and by the way, I forgot to mention that the solution to our project with the no-show patients was to open a clinic in the neighborhood where those patients were located. <laughs> but I think a lot of it, too, is communication. And you know, we do a lot of this, um, you know, if, if you look at the panel even here, we have many different um, areas that we're working in. And how do we communicate that, especially across areas that we're not necessarily 
um, affiliated with. So I think that when we look at the science of this, I would say yes to all of the above that you had asked, and I would say plus more. <laughs> and more I, that we're not talking about. Right, because I think that there is a lot to this that, um, again, goes external to um, other kinds of uh, disciplines. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to add uh, one point. Uh, I think you guys covered it very well. But uh, uh, the unintended consequences. So um, as we were um, brainstorming with uh, one of the local communities, and uh, my emphasis, as I say, is look at traffic and mobility and how people go from A to B. The, the person from that community said, well, actually, we have no cameras, so we couldn't uh, look at the camera. But if you, by any reason, by looking at uh, Waze or, or Google or whatever, can tell us the traffic, can give us an idea, automate the traffic, automate the uh, traffic analysis on this particular part of town, that will help a lot our police. And I said, what? Oh, yeah, because we know that at certain hours, certain places, certain patterns of traffic will tell us about certain social activities. So there are these unintended consequences, and that's why, Jim, I think that we really need to get the technologies with the social scientists and with everybody else. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else want to touch on that, or we could open it up for uh, um, Can I mention one of the sciences you didn't mention? Yes, please. Uh, you didn't mention computer science. <laughs> uh, I, I, smart I was, cities yeah. are very interesting uh, because they stress computer science ideas in severe and new ways. And from that intersection arise many new algorithms, many new techniques. Um, <coughs> let me, in fact, pick up on the point that Jose just made. He mentioned traffic and ways and so on. Um, so many of you, I'm sure, drive with Google Maps and you see the coloring that indicates how crowded a particular area is. That is done without any human input, okay? It's done purely by participating drivers having their smartphones report GPS location periodically, and then that gets fused and the map appears. So completely untouched by human, no distraction to drivers, works well. But it doesn't tell you why something is red. Is it, it's, it relates to the point that Manuela made a moment ago. Is it red because it's just a temporary uh, a, a car rack that's going to be moved in a minute? Or is it red because it's down from four lanes to two and it's going to be this way the whole week? Yeah, there's no information. Now there's another company called Waze, which was purchased by Google for $1 billion B in 2013. This is how valuable they considered it which consists of people reporting information. It gives you a lot more information, but it's distracting. If a driver has to do it, that's not very good. We already have distracted drivers. Could you get the level of detail of ways without active human intervention? Could I run uh, computer vision with you know, convolutional neural networks right at the point of capture of the video data on a car? convert that into information such as dead deer in left lane at GPS coordinates x, y, and transmit it. And that is the kind of new opportunities that, are, that emerge when you try to apply the computer science ideas to this kind of domain. And so to me, I find this very exciting, not only because of the potential to do good, but I think to me personally, even more for the computer science to be better because the challenges posed are much greater, and there's a wide range of challenges. I don't want to dominate the, the talking here, but we can go into that in response to questions or further discussion. Mm -hmm. Paula, would you like? Uh, I think that, I mean, everybody said the right thing. I just want to pick on the prediction and exactly on this non-human aspect. Uh, I think that one aspect of the sciences that we also need is the sciences of a lot of, of course, the machine learning, the prediction, and the causality. A lot of the things in the actual sits are about what if, they are counterfactuals. What if we would do this? What if this would happen? It's a lot of prediction, but driven by specific questions. Uh, it's not prediction about only how the current dynamics of the system mm -hmm. evolves, but it's about predictions of where would the systems be 
if something would happen differently. So you want to perturbate this particular kind of system, which is the city, and hypothesize what will happen if we change the, these traffic? What will happen if a hurricane comes and blocks all the south of, the, of Manhattan? What will happen if the parade of the St. Patrick's Parade takes over all Fifth Avenue? So there is a lot of counterfactuals that people uh, need to solve and need to come up with models of what happens. And for those, we can have but also computer science and machine learning solutions and engineering in which we kind of can simulate these very complex systems uh, to, to try to stretch their sensitivity to dynamics and to change so we can eventually answer questions of, that help people be ready for all these outliers of the distributions because it seems that Everything that is like within the average, we are fine. But when there is a sandy storm, when there is a big snowstorm, everything kind of the system collapses. So the outliers, in some sense, are things in which the technology can make great contributions because maybe we already have thought of those situations if we train systems to be able to think about counterfactuals. And that's like one area that I think is very important is this kind of like uh, simulation, hypothesizing, uh, coming up with models that enable us to uh, reason about counterfactuals. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, at this point, I'd like to open it up for questions from the audience. Yes, Ben. Thank you. Um, my name is Ben Levine with MetroLab Network. A question for whoever wants to jump in and answer it. Um, how do you and your colleagues reconcile the academic incentives, I guess, at the various levels of progression within the academic cycle with the fact that challenges facing local governments and communities are inherently very cross-disciplinary? And do you think that academia as a whole is sort of well incentivized to solve these kind of challenges? And what can we do to <coughs> encourage that kind of behavior going forward? I'll, uh, well, I'll, I'll jump in and start because my project is very much um, the eye on the end of our project is can this actually be implemented in the city. And so I think that that has to be thought out when we do all of these projects. And, and I think that the panel this uh, morning talked about this with the deans. You know, how can we do this financially? Um, we can't do any of this without the city, frankly. We could do all of this research, but we can't deploy it. So I think that, uh, for me at least, throughout all of our project is we bring in the interdisciplinary team that we need um, to solve these problems. But I think it also goes beyond that. It goes to the understanding of the different disciplines. We so much work in silos, and we may not understand. So the project that I'm working on has entertainment technology students in the gaming world working with urban planners, and you know, we, we need to cross um, we, we need to cross educate a lot of these uh, projects as well, especially the interdisciplinary. So I was going to add to that that if there's any university that could do well in in those terms, it's Carnegie Mellon, right? So we already do this almost in our DNA. Uh, second point I want to make is you you are correct that academia being what it is to ask a junior faculty member to spread himself or herself thin by many engagements which may not be directly focused on all the obvious metrics of academic success might be bad advice. But you know, eventually you get to be a full professor. They don't tell you what you're full of at that point. Okay? <laughs> but you hopefully have a few more decades left. And so there is no reason. So I look at my immediate colleagues, Manuela and Jose and myself, and. Uh, many of the uh, uh, excuses that one might say okay to, to a junior faculty member don't apply to us. So I think you're absolutely correct, but there comes a point when we have the freedom, we have the independence, and which direction we choose to go in is ours to choose. Other questions? Yes, Roger. So uh, go back to a question that uh, Jim, I thought, was trying to ask which is uh, looking at, I guess, the uh, uh, exemplary work done by each of the panelists. Uh, for example, Josie focuses on mobility, for example. Right? Um, so, so to me, but there is a higher level requirement of kind of a compositional science, which takes individual scientific uh, uh, principles in each silo, so to speak, mobility or uh, health or uh, social welfare and so on, 
and then bringing those uh, model science together into an overarching science where we can actually explore the interactions among these various uh, uh, models, if you will. So I guess my question is, is that uh, notion of uh, composition science hopeless to achieve? Mm -hmm. This is within the realm of reason. I guess we can accomplish that in five years, 10 years, 20 years. That's one part of the question. The second part is that uh, even from where you stand today, are there very difficult problems that need to be solved? It's just a matter of time and resources. Are there some problems that we do not know how we can solve today? And therefore, they become fundamental challenges for the future. Can I can yes, uh, try to, to focus? So I have two, two things to say. First, um, some years ago, so looking at cities, I was talking again with one of the physicists. And I start saying, oh, maybe we should look at, at uh, cities and try to understand the DNA of the city and so forth. And he said, oh, go and read Schrodinger. Schrodinger in the 40s. Schrodinger is a physicist. Schrodinger in the 40s, a, a, a physicist, gave a talk to whoever or wherever, where he kind of predicted DNA. So he, he said, we, look, we should look at, just like in physics, there are particles, and particles follow certain rules and uh, physical rules, and so they engage among themselves and form these very complex systems. We should look at the equivalent of particles. He was totally wrong, by the way. But uh, an equivalent and try to explain biology from the point of view of interactions of these uh, very elementary components. And it's fascinating, actually, to, to read uh, Schrodinger's uh, lecture that he gave. So start thinking, maybe we should do the same with cities. But I'm not Schrodinger, and so I can't think like him. So I, th I take the exactly opposite point of view. And that's, again, my friend Don there, over there. And uh, he said, Jose, why are you looking at cameras and look and counting cars and all that? Why are you doing that? that that's useless. Uh, so OK, Don, then tell me what, what should I be doing? You should be answering the questions that the city or the town asks you. OK, so let's go back to the town. Let's go back, bring those people in. What is it that you want? And that's where they come and say, well, we are concerned that uh, they are going to build a shopping mall, sh shopping center, five miles away. And our city, our roads are, are already clogged. So what's going to happen? What's the impact? So, Raj, I, want, I kind of gave up on that DNA stuff. It's very nice. But... My limited understanding is more, what is it that you really, as user, so going back to this morning real world problems, what is it that you really want solved? And then me, as a technologist, I can provide a little bit of the tools, analyzing the data, as you said, and maybe provide answers. But I don't know what you want to do with the, you are the one who is going to tell me then what to do with those. With, with the, the results of this technology. So I kind of now try to look the other way around. Why is this useful to solve which particular problem? What are the questions that you want me to address? Right. So can I take a different tack on this? So Raj, you may be absolutely right, but it may be too soon to be asking that question. Okay, if you think back at the long history of natural sciences, say, um, we all look upon Newton's discovery of the laws of motion as a huge, huge event in the history of mankind. But let's face it, he had Kepler and, um, and Copernicus and countless observations from astronomers before him who had sort of built the foundational empirical base upon which he could do the science. So if you're asking about a meta-science of cities, we first need to have a number of smart cities emerge. They may emerge and have similarities. And even more interestingly, they may have differences in the solutions. And it is in trying to understand whether those differences are incidental or somehow correlated to the intrinsic nature of those cities that is going to lead to the insights. So 
I would say your questions are excellent questions. They're just a few decades too soon. Uh, I'm not going to be around when the answers are being found out. You may, though. Uh, I actually am like Schrodinger. I like the DNA. <laughs> but because, you know, I've told these many times when I was in New York also, and I actually believe that cities are a system that is highly, highly constrained. Probably there is a lot of uncertainty too. But you know what? When you build this building and you create you know, apartments that are three bedroom apartments and then the others are one bedroom apartment and you create these many seats on some restaurant and uh, you say that uh, all jobs start at, uh, start at 9 a.m you are really creating the whole infrastructure. I mean, you can, you can model. It's just the, the hard part is the complexity of this model. But notice that the freedom that people have in a city, given the structures that our society created on top of us, are minimal, are minimal. <laughs> the only thing that comes that is uncertain is due to the weather, which we cannot yet control. If the weather were like completely stable, we would know exactly at what time. We even have kids to drop in school. We have all to have lunch. We all get out of bananas in your house and we have to go and buy more at Wall, at uh, Trader Joe's, which is right there. I mean, there is nothing. What is like flexible? Zero. I'm telling you, if it weren't for the processes, there are physical, I mean, the subways come all at the same time. When we are in Germany, or even in New York now, in New York, you have like, in two minutes comes the subway. That's it. In two minutes, the subways, we all go in, we all go out. It's like we are in this machinery. A city, actually, is a machinery that is determining everything. Uh, oh, look, Lincoln Center, even here, Heinz Hall is always at that time. That's it. It's not that we can ask, oh, today's at 7.30, tomorrow is at 9. No, it all starts at this time. We all go into the garage at the same time. We all come out at the same time. We all have lunch, dinner before the, the concert. It's an amazing, uh, defined process. I tell you, I would love to be able to talk about a city as almost a deterministic model with very little variance, with if we if we lock the uncertainty of, okay, the person is, doesn't feel well and go home and there is rain today, if we process, it, it is like kind of like variations, 90% of the city we can all say what's going to happen. And you know what? It's not that like, uh, well, look at the Carnegie Mellon. Don't we have the, all the classes start at some time, end at some time. You know, in, in Gates, the building is empty, comes 10 to noon when the classes end, whoops, there you go. It's, uh, that's it. I, in fact, I was talking with the professor the other day that she said, I have to rush to the, to the restaurant at 11.45, that's it. Because that's when she knows that there is no, going to be no line in this, uh, in this restaurant because the students didn't come out yet. So it's highly predictable, we can model, and we should be able to optimize that modable city. A city is a model. Uh, thank you, uh, Manuel. And in fact, I agree. I think, I I, think I, the I, idea I, is uh, uh, some part of a science could be a model of how the city works. Completely. Uh, uh, Don. Yeah, I, uh, I'd like to pick up on something you said, Manuel, in your opening remarks, uh, because there's cautions about the smart city thing. Yeah. You know, uh, one caution is the big companies are in there, Cisco, IBM, Ericsson, whatever it might be. Are they driving the use case, as Andrew said earlier, are we thinking about, as Jose said, should we be asking what the cities need? Uh, Andrew talked about the Orwellian future. I mean, uh, where's the privacy? Where's all of that? And my point about people versus technology, but you raised another caution that I wanted to pick up on, is responsibility and culpability. Um, if we get to the point where we have these predictive algorithms, and a public of something goes wrong, the public official will say, it wasn't me, it was the algorithm. And so they're off the hook. So could you respond to that? Anybody want to respond to that? Well, let me just say a few, thought about, a few thoughts about this. You know that this type of question, it's not only like um, a question that uh, 
uh, comes from the human side, but from our algorithm side is also difficult because somehow AI and machine learning have been in the business of solving problems for many years, but not telling anyone how they are solved. So our algorithms do this search, and we kind of like are masters of doing search efficiently, but nothing of the search pro process is saved. Uh, nothing of how the weights change is saved. So a lot of our algorithms are about outputting a solution. So currently, to actually be able to support that solution with some rationale on which examples were used or which data made a difference and sensitivity analysis and dependency models, it's also part of our research. And I think that the cities and the fact that we are developing computer science and machine learning and engineering solutions for people made now this question much more relevant than in the future because if someone asks you what's the next prime number, you dump the next prime number and nobody asks you why. You, know, you just actually trust the machine. But if you say no, this, you know, this is like you cannot have a credit card at all, you are going to say why? So when you enter this, 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 this interaction between computer science and computing and the social aspects, including the city, this need for interpretability and explanation is needed. Now, but that's from a technical <coughs> point of view also a challenge for us. We are not, we don't have good math Do that explains why the integral of these is this. We are not all going to say because of the chain rule, because of these, we don't have that. So it's for the next many years to come a challenge to change uh, these, the way that computers process data uh, to be responsible to give answers to. Alex has a response to this too. Thank you, Manuel. Um, I think part of the question that you asked certainly speaks to a desire for transparency or explainability, but the other point I want to address is this idea of accountability. Who is accountable? And I think that brings us outside of the realm of policy and really into law. And there have been initiatives that we can turn to, for instance, in the European Union later this year, the GDPR will be taking effect, which starts to at least introduce not legally binding legislation, but something to that effect requiring some sort of contestability of algorithmic decisions, uh, at least decisions that are made entirely by an algorithmic system and not by a human, um, some review process, and also something that's not entirely in law, but some form of a right to explanation, that when consequential decisions are made about people, there needs to be some accountability, and we can't just throw up our hands and say, the machine told me to do it, or the machine said your loan is denied. Um, but that, I think, speaks to a lot of legal concerns, and I don't know that the United States is quite there yet in planning out that part of the landscape. Good. Thank you. Uh, one more question from Dan. Oh, Sorry. Dan Nagin, and then we'll uh, I'll, I'll briefly sum. This is more of a question of what the, our limits are to prediction. And I'll, I'll give you two, two questions. One's comparatively easier than the other. The, I think the one that's comparatively easier is suppose Mayor de Blasio said, um, I'd like you to give me a prediction of how a, con a, a congestion pricing uh, policy might affect traffic in New York mm -hmm. City. Okay, um, and that's a comparatively easier one. And then the harder one, uh, that I think, would be is if, I can't remember who the mayor was in 1980, but, uh, during the 80s, uh, but if that mayor were to say, please give me a prediction of what New York City is gonna be like now. Yeah. Uh, uh, the way New York City has evolved over the, even over the last 30 years, I think is unimaginable to anybody in this room. And, and I think it's a reflection of the complexity of the these hu of, of, of large human systems. But just do you actually think that maybe there weren't some uh, folks that were envisioning, like Grant Oliphant was talking about this morning, of uh, a Pittsburgh with a cultural district? Back when I grew up, that was not the cultural district. And to imagine that being uh, a cultural district, many of us might not have, but there were some folks that maybe had that, that, that vision. Well, uh, having a vision of where a city should evolve to is different than it may, being able to make predictions about okay. the way it would evolve. And okay. I would assert that nobody could have imagined that New York City, what it is like now, 
even compared to 1990, or, and then certainly not even going back to the 70s. Does those, anybody want to take that? I would that? say it has a lot to do with technology, but I'll refer to my computer science colleagues to. <laughs> well, I mean, the impact of technology is varied on social, social infrastructure and social behavior is actually quite hard. Who would have thought just five years ago that the creation of Facebook could have affected a presidential election? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know there's a there's a famous phrase used for this, which is the black swan. And I think technology of the kind that uh, a number of us work on results in these kinds of black swans from the point of view of human behavior. And I think it's very hard to predict by definition what the consequences of black swans are. You get the last uh, word, Jose, before no, I wrap I, up the panel. I was going to do the opposite. Uh, the opposite question, and I'm reminded of um, the movie uh, Truman's Show. Truman's Show, yes. Everything is so predictable, so enjoyable. Why not? So try to predict the future precisely, and you'll be so happy. I, I, just, I, 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 I want to say one word, but your question is about actually exactly, I love the Truman right. Show, I think yeah. we should all be like, but I tell you something, it's a multimodal problem. It's a lot of things need to be taken into account to do a better prediction. If you take into account like mm -hmm. also the cultural movement in, uh, in New York, who knows? So the hard part is that it's so many factors, mm -hmm. but I believe we can predict. Yeah, and, you know. and so to wrap up, uh, thank you to the first join me in thanking all these panelists. They, they've done a great job. So for example, uh, uh, we, we hear that a, a science of CMU might start to look like a model that has many different uh, uh, phenomena from different sciences uh, influencing the interactions in that model and influencing the predictions. Uh, we, as Jan, as um, uh, Manuela pointed out, we must be able to predict not only uh, what we know if, uh, will happen if nothing is changed, but we need to be able to predict the counterfactuals. The what ifs are going to be very important to even come close to uh, Dan Nagin's uh, concerns. If we make these changes as visionaries 30 years ago, the, the, do we get to where we are today? And what are the variables that cause us to maybe get there and not get there? And finally, I think we heard that um, uh, we must be able to um, use our science uh, to help cities answer the questions they have. So I was going to ask, as a, a dean of the engineering college, does that mean we maybe start out taking more of an engineering approach? The way the boiler makers first designed the boilers for the engines, they didn't have the science. They proceeded forward, and as things were blowing up, they figured they needed to figure out how to better uh, under, understand and develop science. They developed science around that to, to keep them from blowing up. Well, I think we're probably in a middle, middle ground there. We're, we're building the laboratories. Metro 21 is trying to build a laboratory that will get, start to collect sensing of all sorts of uh, different phenomena. And from that will emerge models of parts of the city that will soon become maybe uh, able to be connected. And then we will do, continue a process of trying things, instrumenting, measuring, and modifying. And I think by that, uh, way we'll be able to come up with a very multi-physics compositional, com what did you call it, compositional science-based model of how cities may actually be uh, behaving and, and, and be somewhat predictive. So thank you for your uh, uh, sage advice and your discussion here. Thank you all for your questions, and we now move on to the next session. Thank you. Great.